quick show of hands. How many of you have read the book? A few of you, okay. Well, lots of you, all right. How many of you have heard me speak before? Okay, a bunch of you, all right, got it. All right, so I'm gonna run through the model uh, that we've put together fairly quickly. I wanna uh, open it up more into what we're seeing today and ha have more of a dialogue and some Q&A as to what are you seeing and what questions you might have about where we go with this. As we kind of fundamentally transition from a kind of a scarcity world into this abundance world, note that all of our businesses since the beginning of time are geared around scarcity, right? If you didn't have scarcity, you literally didn't have a business. And so then we created artificial scarcity like the diamonds business or Birkin bags and things like that. And so now we're seeing this new kind of a paradigm where we're moving to abundance. And what we're seeing is a completely new breed of organization where they're organized for abundance. And I'll, I'll kind of describe that, that paradigm. Many of you know my background. Uh, for eight years, we've been building out Singularity. For two years before that, I was the head of innovation at Yahoo running their incubator. And I found that when you try disruptive innovation in any large organization, the immune system will come and attack you, right? Uh, because all our organizations are built to resist change and withstand risk. And maybe the fundamental uh, nature of all of my work over the last few years, especially since the book came out, is how do you solve the immune system problem in big companies? Um, even to the extent that I'm working today a little bit with the Vatican and uh, via Kunal and others, the UN, uh, these are organizations, you know, the Pope has the oldest immune system in the world, right? As he tries to update that organization, he's got some interesting challenges uh, on his hands. Um, a couple of uh, uh, months ago, I actually had the honor of joining the board of XPRIZE. So I'm working with Peter and Marcus at their board level using the, and driving the prize concept uh, forward. Um, so we've seen kind of this paradigm where we're seeing these number of Ds, where we're seeing digitization, disruption, et cetera, et cetera, happen. The really big question is what happens next? How do you organize and react to this new world? So let me go into the model, and then I'll talk about uh, what you do and what, what we advise companies to do. The, the, the reason for the book was we, we would have people coming through our executive programs where people would say, OK, I get the disruption. What the hell do I do on Monday? Right? How do I react to this? How do I adapt to this? And we started developing a thesis around that that became a lecture and then uh, turned into the book. The idea is that we've learned how to scale technology very well. We can go from one user to a million users fairly seamlessly. But as many of you have seen in your careers, building the actual organization is painfully incremental and linear, right? And sublinear as you get as you get bigger. Yet today we're seeing a completely new breed of organization over the last six, eight years, where they've learned how to scale the organization as fast as we can scale technology. And that's what we call exponential organizations. The definition is that we're seeing this new breed that's delivering 10x performance improvements compared to their peers. Because we can see all this disruption on the outside, but we can also see massive disruption in each of our internal business functions. Like sales and marketing is almost completely digital today. There's almost no analog component left to it. And we see these kinds of quotes that we're all familiar with, uh, where software easy is eating the world. But this quote from David Rose is the one that's been sticking in my uh, craw for the last few years. He makes the point, as does John Hagel does, that all of our organizations are built for efficiency and for predictability. They're not built to be agile, adaptable, or flexible, and yet we're seeing that's the high order bit. Right? We operate with large hierarchical silos uh, with multiple layers, hierarchically very command and control, and decision making goes up and information flows go up and down, not across very well. I remember talking to the CIO of Citibank a few years ago, and he said, we have 300 different customer databases. And God help you, the loans guys don't want to let the savings guys know what their customer base looks like. And it's like, wow. And so this is the big challenge in all of our organizations. And so the question then is, how do you deal with this? Now, this new organization that we're seeing, as I said, are a minimum 10x performance uh, improvement compared to their peers in the same space. We are tracking an index over over 100 such organizations now. And the analytical part of the book, about half of it is how are they doing it? What are the techniques and mechanisms they're using to achieve this extraordinary scale? A couple of examples to kind of make this a bit more alive. The first and more obvious one is TED. Right, 10 years ago, TED was a nice high-end conference, about 1,000 people a year going to Monterey. Chris Anderson took it over. He did three things. He established a huge purpose, ideas worth spreading. He then allowed anybody to watch a TED talk by putting them all online for free. And then he allowed anybody to go create a TEDx event. And in 10 years, he's created a global media brand. Nobody has ever created a global media brand that fast. And his cost of doing so was literally zero. 
So you can take an established environment, apply a set of principles, and blow it open to a global level today. And we're seeing that happen more and more. Um, another good example is in a more traditional industry is this company, Local Motors. How many of you are familiar with Local Motors? Right, hopefully a few. So this is a car company out of Arizona um, where they have about 100,000 um, kind of car mechanics and car enthusiasts that operate as a social network that help them design cars. Uh, so here are the metrics. If you're a typical car company, it costs about $3 billion to design a new car from scratch. These guys do it for $3 million. That's a 1,000 times better than the status quo. Typical car has 25,000 spare parts, uh, extra parts. These, this literally takes 50 parts for the whole car. Typical car takes about 1,000 man hours to put together. Theirs takes one. And a typical car plant is about a million square feet. And theirs can be made literally on the size of the state. So here are four metrics on which they're blowing away the status quo by multiple orders of magnitude each. Right? So if you're a typical car company, how the hell do you compete with that? And the answer is you don't. You can't. You have three possible responses. The first is buy them, shut them down. Right? That's option one. And we used to, we've seen this before in the energy business or the payments business where startups were bought and then shut down because uh, 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 GE is, uh, sorry, GM is famous for pulling back all its electric cars and just quashing them, and that gave rise to Tesla. The second option is to uh, uh, basically... Um, uh, lobby the government, pass legislation, and, and legislate them out of existence. Right? And we've, we're seeing that in some of our older industries today. Uh, financial services not being, being one of them, but energy being a classic one. The third is more optimal, which is learn from them, invest in them, buy them, acquire them, whatever, and partner with them and figure out what they're doing and bring it into your organizations. And that's what we're seeing more and more of, and that's where newer companies are seeing happen more and more. Now, there's three components that go into building one of these uh, kind of EXOs, as we call them. The first is they all have what I call an MTP, a massive transformative purpose. Uh, XPRIZE has just taken theirs on. How do you get to a bridge to, how do you bridge to abundance? Uh, all exponential organizations have one of these. It's kind of a tagline, like Google's organize the world information. Uber is everybody's private driver. Sing, uh, singularities go, Im uh, go impact a billion people positively, right? Um, and we're starting to see this model bite more and more. You see there at the bottom Coca-Cola's recent mantra, open happiness. So this replaces the traditional mission statement. And you kind of, we're seeing keep, keep people get rid of their mission statements and their five-year strategic plans and replace it with an MTP and a one-year plan that's operating in real time, constantly keeping the ship steered in the right direction. Uh, Paul Pullman, two years ago, who's the CEO of Unilever, read the book two years ago and ordered every brand in Unilever to take on an MTP. And now, today, as of a few months ago, their five most profitable brands are the ones that have taken this on the most. So we're starting to see the model really kind of bite. Uh, the CEO of Gucci just gave me a quote saying, I intend to turn Gucci into an exponential uh, organization. Um, here you see some kind of fabulous MTPs there. The second component is five externalities that these organizations are using that allow them to keep a very small resource footprint and use one or more of these to scale very quickly outwards. Right? So Uber doesn't hire its own staff. TED is using community. Uh, Google is using algorithms. Airbnb is leveraging other people's bedrooms. And then you have the whole digital engagement model, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, incentive prizes, gamification to keep learning and understanding what your users are doing. Um, think about Uber. The mission critical function in Uber, which is to match driver and passenger, doesn't happen inside the organization. Right? It happens out in the wild. And by enabling that with technology, you can scale very, very quickly. So these, this becomes really critical. And importantly, what these new organizations are finding out is they're finding business models around abundance. Uber is tapping into an abundance of cars lying around, Airbnb an abundance of extra bedrooms that they're information enabling in that sense. And this is disrupting even traditional industries. Many of us look at an industry like construction, and we think, OK, how would you disrupt construction? Right? It's not obvious how you might go about uh, doing that. Um, uh, because you still need to build physical buildings. The physicality of the world is there, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you uh, are aware of that industry, every four years there's a mini boom when the Olympics comes around, and 60,000 hotel rooms have to be put together in wherever the, whatever city it is. And so they send their, in the case of Rio, where the last Olympics were happening, the, the big construction companies sell their, send their advanced scouting teams out a few years beforehand. They figure out where they might they put their hotels, who do they have to bribe, et cetera, et cetera, to get this done. Rio looks at their city and says, we have no space. Let's just partner with Airbnb. 
and 60,000 hotel rooms don't get built, right? And so kind of even in mature and very physicalized industries, we're seeing this uh, disruption in different ways, in different angles. So those are the five externalities. Then there's five internal mechanisms that we use to drive culture and manage the internal control framework. Uh, interfaces between the company and all of that abundance on the outside, like Uber's interfaces with its drivers or Apple's interfaces with its App Store developers. Uh, the second is the whole real-time dashboards where, I said, as I said, companies are instrumenting them themselves literally in real time and tracking everything in that basis. The third is the whole lean startup methodology, um, uh, which turns out, by the way, not to work so well for startups, but works really well if you have existing processes that you want to iterate. And this also includes radically, radical taking of risk. Amazon, for every team in the company, is measuring how many, how many experiments did you run this quarter, how many succeeded, how many failed. If you're not running enough experiments, and if not enough are failing, you're not doing your job. You're not pushing the boundaries enough. Right? Uh, the fourth one is all the whole decentralized org structure kind of paradigm that's going along. And the, this is enabled by this kind of fifth one, all of the social technologies like Slack, Slack Jive, Yammer, et cetera, et cetera. We have very good evidence today that horizontal communication patterns and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration are much more valuable than the vertical communication patterns and the vertical command and control patterns that we've grown up with. And so if you can do this, you literally don't need the org structure in the same way that we did. How many of you are familiar with Valve software? Can I see a show of hands? So Valve is a software company out of Seattle of about 400 people. No CEO, no reporting lines, no job descriptions, no management meetings, no middle management layers of any kind. They literally operate like a beehive. Each person self-selects what they want to do. So if I spot a bug in the software, I grab three people that I think can crack that bug. We go fix it. We disband. Now, it sounds kind of hokey and sounds weird, but they get more revenue per employee than Microsoft by doing this. This is not a joke. Zappos, the e-commerce company, is moving to this model with quite a lot of difficulty because it's really hard to implement into an existing organization. The poster child of this one, this paradigm, though, is Hiar, the Chinese appliance manufacturer. These guys make 55 million fridges and ovens a year. And the CEO a few years ago looked at his organization, which was 80,000 people in a classic hierarchical pyramid structure, and decided, I can't meet my corporate goals using this structure. So he blew it up, turned 80,000 people into 2,000 autonomous teams of about 40 people each. Each team elects their own leader. Each team decides whatever they want to do. Each team has a P&L. Now, any of us growing up in the business world think that if you make 55 million fridges and ovens, you need a truckload of centralized demand forecasting, supply chain management, inventory management, product strategy. Turns out you don't. You know, who knew? Uh, and so fascinating to see that this is possible. So when they decide what features should go into the new fridge, the teams just vote. And because they're all interfacing with external partners and vendors and suppliers, they get a much better result than some product strategy team sitting at the center trying to guess what the customer might want. Right? And so we're seeing this pattern happen even in this type of environment. In Canada, you, the, the, we had ING Direct, which turned it into what's called Tangerine Bank. And a regulated bank in Canada operates on this basis. They have a no uh, internal structure or middle management of any kind. They literally have a fluid workforce. So when they do an online promotion, everybody swarms to the phone banks. When it's regulatory reporting time, the chief risk officer jumps up and down, and everybody swarms to those systems. And they deliver six times more uh, uh, customer accounts per employee than any other bank, and four times as many deposits per employee as any other bank. And so they're really delivering in this case. Now, not everybody does all of these, but we've worked out that if you do four out of the 10, your effectiveness of your organization increases 10x. So which four is the big question, depending on, varies depending on industry, size of company, et cetera, et cetera. This is from the epilogue of the book. This is the valuation of the top 10 EXOs. And the two columns are when I started writing the book to when I finished writing the book. And you can see the incredible multiplier as these, co and these companies are growing unbelievable ways. In 10 quarters, I should have been building one of these rather than writing about it, uh, but there you go. And maybe the core insight that, that kind of emerged as the thesis of this, uh, the economic basis of these companies, came out almost at the very end. Uh, you know, when you're running a business, you worry about demand and supply, and very specifically what's the cost of demand, what's the cost of supply. What the internet did for us, for the business world, was it allowed us for the first time in the history of business to drop the cost of demand. Right? If you online marketing, referral marketing, if I get a viral loop, my acquisition costs go to zero. 
And that was the first time in the history of business you could acquire customers at no cost. Fabulous. But what these EXOs have figured out is how do you drop the cost of supply exponentially? You think about Airbnb, the marginal cost of adding a room to their inventory is almost zero. If you're Hyatt, you have to build a whole new hotel. Right? Same with Uber, same with Waze, et cetera, et cetera. And so now we have startups entering legacy industries with almost zero marginal cost of supply. And that is an existential threat if you're the incumbent, because you have a tough time competing with that in many cases. So how do you deal with that? And so this is the fascinating insight that we have. There's a whole set of implications and kind of this is a whole chapter on different headlines on how, what we're having see happen. It's way better to be a smaller organization today than a big one. Uh, you have to do real-time instrumentation. Clearly, disruption is the new norm. Uh, beware the experts. We've already talked a bit about that. Uh, trust beats control and open beats closed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, two years ago, we st stood here and we actually took the Fortune 100 and we ranked the Fortune 100 uh, ranked by their EXO score. So we created a diagnostic survey in the book uh, where we can actually quantify how flexible is your organization structure. And if you can create a quantified metric around that, it gives you some targets and some way of tracking this. Here's the full list of the Fortune 100 ranked by their EXO score. Uh, we'll give you a copy of these slides uh, if you're so interested. But you see at the top a lot of technology companies, et cetera, et cetera. Most interesting, Hulk Business School did a stock market analysis, and they found that your stock market performance correlates directly with the flexibility of your organization, right? which makes sense. Right? As the external world becomes more volatile, your ability to adapt is going to drive market value. In fact, if you had uh, invested in just in the top 10 most flexible companies, you would have outperformed the S&P by three times over this last two years. So our strategy is really simple. Go rank every stock market, public stock market in the world, create an ETF that will invest in the top 10. And that should do very well over time. Right? And maybe even short the bottom 10. And so we'll see how that works out. Uh, very interesting to see, because in extreme volatility, you can, of course, make very good money, as you know very well in this world. So then the big question becomes, if you have a legacy business, what do you do? How do you react to this pace of change? The first piece of advice is update your leadership that we are in this new world, right? So we have tremendous tension between existing legacy thinkers in our businesses and what's happening in the real world. Let's take a company like um, BMW. Uh, BMW's tagline is, we're the ultimate driving machine. We're pretty clear nobody's going to be driving. So that's a pretty big tension to navigate if you're that company, right? And think about that. Every manufacturing specification, every engineering protocol, every design aesthetic across the whole company is saying optimize for the driver. And the world is going 180 degrees the other way. And so that's an enormous challenge with our legacy industries on the what to do. I won't go through all of these, but the second one I think is worth touching on. It's the most structurally relevant. Um, uh, the big idea here, similar to John Hagel's thought and derivative from John Hagel's work, is do not try and do disruptive innovation inside. It causes too much tension, you'll invoke the immune system response, and nobody has any fun in that environment. Our strong suggestion is do incremental change to the core organization and do disruptive things at the edge, pointing to adjacent areas. Uh, a few years ago, Larry Page came to me and said, hey, your unit at Yahoo is really successful. Should I do that at Google? And I said, no, you'll still have the same immune system response, but do something like it and point it away. And you see the result with Google X, where they have their core information capabilities, and they add hardware at the edges like Google Car, Google Glass, Google Loon to go into adjacent areas. Uh, yeah, they're interested in transportation, but each Google Car is collecting a gigabyte of data per second per car. So that's what they're really interested in. So they're really literally mapping the world in real time. Um, if you move your flower pot on your windowsill, Google will now know. Um, the NSA already knows, as you heard from Mark this morning, but now Google will know also. Right? And so uh, interesting to see there. But the master of this technique is actually Apple. Apple has created a hyper-successful company. And yeah, they have a great design capability and a great technology supply chain. I argue that their core innovation is actually organizational. What Apple does, unlike anybody else in the world, is they'll take a small team that's very disruptive, they'll take them to the edge of the organization, they'll keep them completely stealth, and they'll, they'll say, go attack another industry. Right? Nobody does this. So they started with what? Music, and then phones, and then tablets, and now payments, cars, retail, watches, healthcare, 
there's no limit to their market cap. They can just keep knocking over industry after industry. So they have a portfolio of teams looking at their various industries, and when it's ripe for disruption using their capabilities, they go in and go after it and fold it back into the platform play. Right? And as we enter a world where either you're the disruptor or you're disrupted, we think other large organizations have to follow through. So I work a lot today at a board level of Fortune 100 companies, giving them board workshops and C-suite workshops as to what should happen in the future. Um, as I mentioned, a key success criteria is trying to become a platform. We saw on the internet, BlackBerry, Nokia, uh, Yahoo, all failed to become a platform. If you succeeded, then you do very well and you wire yourself into the infrastructure. We can see Uber trying to become a platform very desperately in its sense. And there's a number of kind of war stories around this. There's a few interesting ones. I'll give you a, a kind of a positive and a negative one. A great positive one is Nespresso, right? We've seen the radical success of that where the CEO took a team, put it away from the core, core organization. The CFO was not allowed anywhere near it because he would defund it if he could. Uh, and then we've seen the incredible success of it. It's now a $5 billion line of business within four years for Nestle, right? Staggering success. Uh, Walmart is maybe the biggest negative case study in this case. Uh, Walmart 10 years ago realized they had to compete with Amazon, that this whole e-commerce thing was not a fad. So they set up a team inside Bentonville and said, okay, we have the best distribution inventory logistics systems in the world, go beat Amazon. And within 18 months, the immune system had killed this team. It was done. Because all the existing executives said, we shouldn't be doing this. We should optimize for our own stores. Amazon will never succeed. Look at the way it's losing money, et cetera, et cetera. So they set up, did it again. They set up a second team, uh, and they did it at the edge. So they put a team at the edge of the organization, but still said, hey, go leverage our existing systems because we have this incredible asset. Let's leverage it, which was typical thinking in many of our businesses today. 18 months later, that was dead. So they did it a third time. The third time they did it, they put a team at the edge and said to them, incredibly courageously, go create your own independent supply chain distribution systems, inventory systems, because we keep messing with you. Right? The third time it started to succeed, the business got excited, pulled it back in too early, and killed it. And it was on iteration number four, and you think of the careers, the churn, the opportunity cost, the money spent, the time, et cetera. On attempt number four, they did it separately, independently, using the CEO of Jet.com as, as a kind of placeholder for that. And only after it achieved critical mass did they start stitching the back ends together. And so after the fourth iteration, they finally got it right. But in that time period of eight years, Amazon's gone. And now it's too late. Right? And so you cannot afford And the lesson I take from this, it's just really hard. We've never had to do this before as a business community. There's no MBA program in the world that teaches you this. In fact, I'll, give, I'll tell you that every MBA program in the world teaches you how to build a 20th century organization. Right? There's not a single MBA program in the world that can teach you how to build Uber. And so how do we deal with that? Now, we talk a lot about the intransigence of government, and we like complaining about them. The one constituency way harder than government is academia. Right? And God help you if you try and update that kind of institution in that sense. So tons of really interesting things happening. RWE is a German utility that read the book a couple of years ago, decided to break up their organization into the core legacy entity and the new stuff at the edge. So they created a separate entity called Innoji, and uh, we worked with them to help them figure out their MTP, and they're moving forward in that way. Um, Amazon has done something really fascinating, which you can all take back to your organizations. Uh, they recognized a long time ago that it's really hard in a big company to stop people from saying no. It's really easy. One of 50 uh, senior managers can say no, and it'll kill an initiative. So they have an institute, a policy inside Amazon called the institutional yes. So if you come to me inside Amazon with an idea, I'm, I'm not allowed to say no. My default answer has to be yes. If I want to say no, I have to write a two-page thesis as to why it's a bad idea and post it publicly. So they've created friction and embarrassment to saying no, which means that many more ideas get tried and tested all the way through. One of the results of this was actually Amazon Web Services. Nobody could figure out how to say no to this thing, nothing to do with their core business, and now one of the most successful products of all time. Right? And so it was fascinating to see some of the techniques people are using to hack it. Now, we are seeing some success stories. Fuji recognized that the film business was uh, dwindling and was going to die, but they had all this expertise in powders, coatings, chemicals. They created a very successful next life as a cosmetics business. And so they're not in, in that world, right? Um, Microsoft is doing an incredible job of moving from a software sales to a subscription model. Amazing rise of Office 365 uh, kind of out, 
accelerating many of the other internet companies. And we're seeing more and more companies look at their core capabilities and say, where can I apply this into an adjacent area? Here's an announcement that came out a few months ago. That's a spherical vertical farm. You can see the guy at the bottom there. That structure will feed an entire neighborhood sustainably. Okay? Anybody know who's doing this? This is IKEA. Right? So they're using their core capabilities to go into a completely adjacent area. Of course, when you finish building that, there's a ton of spare parts left over, right? There'll be a ton of like dowels, et cetera, et cetera. And there'll be a whole cottage industry in getting rid of that, uh, that, that stuff. And so fascinating to see. And we're starting to see this model start to take place more and more. What we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years is we've created a, a kind of a 10-week process where we figured out how to solve the immune system problem in large organizations. So we run a process framework um, uh, that we call an EXO sprint where we get kind of 25% um, 20, of all management and we give them a half a day kind of session like this where we really freak them out and wake them up that the world is really disruptive. Then we take uh, 15 or 20 young leaders, future lieutenants uh, from the company, and they do the work over the 10-week period. It takes about 30% of their time. One stream looks at what disruptive things should we do at the edge that will take the company 10x. And the other stream is saying, okay, what should we do to upgrade the mothership? And at the end, they literally pitch for funding, and if senior management likes it, they fund this. So we piloted this with Procter & Gamble a couple of years ago, and it went staggeringly well. We've now done it five times. Uh, the latest one was Rossini, the car brakes manufacturer. They make all the brakes for Tesla, et cetera, et cetera. And the CEO was so excited when we finished the sprint, he said, let's just do it again. So we're doing it a second time, uh, running through that same process. We're very excited about this. We're actually going to open source this process. Because my thesis is every one of the global 5,000 has to go through this process with or without us, and we'll never get to them. So let's open source it, and everybody can self-provision and run this process for themselves in that sense. Okay? So we've cracked this immune system problem, which we're very, very excited about. So because as you know, and we've talked about, this pace of change is not slowing down. This is actually going to accelerate. So we, what we think will happen in the future is we're going to see uh, core organizations dealing with their legacy industries and selling into scarcity, but at the edge, they'll be building new models that are experimenting with abundance uh, and trying to see with the bigger, the big elephant in the room for all of this digitization is where is the money, right? Where is the money? Because we see this huge deflationary dynamic take place when we digitize these industries, and how do we deal with that? So let me pause there. Let me see if there's any questions that people have. I left a significant amount of time for some discussion. Curious if you have any questions. Thank you for having me. Great to be here again. So questions. Yes, sir. Shout it out, and I'll repeat the question. So what's next? I mean, you, that was a nice recap. What's, what's next? Uh, I think this paradigm will take hold, and it'll take a while to roll out. Uh, and my short answer what, that I'm sidestepping is I have no idea. Um, um, we don't know how this, what happens next. We've never been in this position before, right? For the first time ever, we're transitioning more and more industries from a scarcity material-based, incremental-based version of the world into a very radical digital version of the world. Um, and we're seeing massive industries under huge threat. Let's take, um, you know, you've seen already Ramez's talk about solar, right? Um, but with battery storage coming along, in about seven years, once you have solar and storage at the right level of maturity, the business model of every utility disappears. Right? So if that's the case, when you have autonomous cars, we've worked out that it'll be 10 to 15 times easier to get in and out of big cities. Well, what happens to real estate values, which are spiking in the middle of big cities globally, as that happens? And in more related in your world, how do you do wealth management if you can't rely on real estate, you can't rely on utilities, et cetera, et cetera? How do you, where do you put your money? And so we're going to see some interesting disruptions take place. I think what, and I'll touch on what I think will happen uh, after this next session, because I'll be doing the closing kind of wrap up of, the, of these three days, and I'll give you some more thoughts then uh, in that sense. Okay? Other questions? Yeah. Here's a mic coming. Uh, okay, you've said that it's for the first time in history, it, there's no cost to get customers, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So, but nowadays, you know, I've been talking with the financial industry, Fintech, and you know, there, there's a paradigm that, you know, incumbents have clients, and Fintech uh, are, won't be able to get too much volume because it's too expensive to get that volume of customers. What do you think about? Um, so, 
if you can get a viral loop going, then your cost of customer acquisition goes to zero, right? This is why every Silicon Valley company is trying to architect itself to get that viral loop going. Uh, in a more traditional industry, which is much more face-to-face, -face, et cetera, that's harder. Uh, but somebody's working on it, and people are going to try and crack that because there's so much incentive to dropping that cost of acquisition, right? And so if you can figure out how to do that, that's the big challenge today in other ways. It's not clear how one goes about doing that in some of the older mechanisms. But obviously, with, if I have a viral loop around robo-advisors and so on, that'll, that'll figure out, that'll scale very, very quickly. Right? And so a couple of key ways we think about it is, is your business information enabled? And can you grow it this way? And let me give you a specific example in your industry. There's a startup called 49, 49, 49th Financial or 49 Financial, which is financial advisors. Um, he read the book uh, three years ago when it came out, and he launched a company based on the book. And in, from zero, he's gone to managing about uh, 50 million in the first two years, about 300 million now, and he's doubling every two years. And he's increasing the number of advisors by 3x every two years by applying these techniques. So it's very possible to do that. I'll give you another example in a very traditional industry. Um, uh, there's a company out of Vancouver called Build Direct, where it's, it's B2B lo heavy logistics, so they move heavy equipment around. You can't get more traditional than that. Um, he read the book, and he took, what he did was, the CEO, he took um, 10, he started 10 projects for each of the 10 attributes. So he started 10 projects. One team said, okay, what, what are you doing to implement algorithms inside the company? You guys, what are you guys doing to leverage community? You guys, what are you doing to leverage autonomy and implement that? And every three months, he re-ups the projects. His market cap has gone from 50 million to 300 million to 700 million in two years. Right? So it's very doable. And if you look at the success of TED or Local Motors, we're seeing this explosion of this new breed. Now, if you're not building and architecting your company in this fashion with very low marginal cost, somebody else is. Right? So it, you kind of have to do it as a starting point today. If you're building a startup, you should be deploying almost all of those from the get-go. In fact, there's now about eight or 10 incubators around the world where the diagnostic survey we created is used as the application form to get into the incubator. I was like, hey, wait a minute. I've never even thought of that use case, but great. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Uh, first, okay. uh, what's your experience of applying the exponential organization to healthcare organization? Second question is, as a consumer, where is uh, the consumer's uh, uh, transparency? How are, each, how are consumers aware of uh, the platform is using the information or data to make money? Sure. So the first one is, how would you apply this to healthcare? Um, I think what we're going to see now, healthcare and financial services are tough because of the regulatory environment, right? Uh, and people often use this as an excuse. And I talk to a lot of bank CEOs who kind of can't stand the regulators, et cetera. And I say, are you kidding? It's your best friend. Uh, your regulatory environment is, is the moat that's keeping the hordes of startups from ripping the industry to shreds. And so love your regulators would be one uh, uh, thought there. And in healthcare, this is particularly true just because of the, uh, of the pace of change. But there are some dramatic things happening in healthcare, mostly around new treatments, new capabilities that we think will radically change the industry. Uh, the most obvious one is the Tricorder X Prize. Have we talked about that yet? Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Tricorder X Prize? Okay, so it's a $10 million prize for literally the Star Trek tricorder. Somebody would win $10 million when your handheld device beats 10 board certified doctors in doing a diagnosis. Okay, so handheld, if your handheld device can outperform 10 board certified doctors, you win $10 million on like 15 different medical conditions, et cetera, et cetera. 330 teams competed for this. The winner was announced on April 12th, two months ago. So as of two months ago, we have a handheld device that will beat most doctors, and nobody in the healthcare world knows this has happened. Why? Because disruptive innovation always comes from outside your industry. Right? And that will have massive implications for rural areas where it's hard to get to a doctor, or developing countries where we have a doctor per million citizens. Right? Uh, I joke that if you're a hypochondriac, you'll totally love this gadget. Right? In fact, you'll buy two of them because one of them must be wrong. It'll be chaos for a while while we figure that out. So I think a combination of new devices, new treatments will radically upend the industry. And what we think will happen is we'll be forced to update our regulatory structures because of the medical tourism stuff that's happening. Peter recently was advised he should have shoulder surgery for his shoulder. He flew to Panama and got stem cell injections because they've approved the treatments there. 
and you can avoid surgery in many cases by doing things like that. So we'll start to see a lot more of that type of capability take place because if the treatment's there, why not, the hell not try it and why not try it out? And so we'll see a lot of stress on the existing environments. And that's true in other areas as well. The FAA banned drones, right? And Amazon kind of said, we, have, we want to do drones testing. They went up to British Columbia and Canada and they did all their drones testing there. Um, finally, the FAA said, no, no, we're really sorry, come back. And so we're, start, we're going to see increased pressure on our regulatory environments to kind of upgrade themselves in that case. Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. We'll go there and then there. Hang on, there's a, there's a mic coming to you. Thank you. Further to your general roles, and the, what are your advice to build up exponential Nonprofit organization. Thank you. How do you build an exponential nonprofit organization? Uh, very, very similarly, you you start with our advice. If you're starting an EXO, is uh, I'll give you four steps. The full uh, we've got it fully laid out in a chapter, and Peter's book Bold lays this out very well. Um, but the, for our step one is pick an MTP. Pick the problem space that you want to transform, that you're really passionate about and excited about. Step two, go join a set of communities in that problem space. So if you want to solve cancer, there's lots of cancer meetups, et cetera, et cetera, around that. Step three, form a team uh, of people that are in, and if you're in the for-profit side, we typically advocate uh, an engineer, a designer, a business model guy, and a lead evangelist type of person. Uh, step four is the breakthrough idea or product or service. Okay? Now note that that's step four because we think you should do that later. Uh, once you're excited about a particular space, you'll find ideas coming through. Make sure your idea is at least 10x better than the current status quo and than the current market offers. If you offer something that's 10% better or 20% better, the market will ignore you. If you deliver something that's 10 times better, the market cannot ignore you. And then you have a, you have a chance. And then, we've got, then you implement the lean startup methodology of coming up with a minimum viable product and then go down that path. So that's our suggestion there for any EXO in general. Okay? Other questions? Yes, sir. You talked about solving the immune system problem. Yeah. What do you do with the remainder of the old organization? Do you bring them along or do you say... God, say no. Where you are? Don't bring them along. So how do you stop uh, them from taking on a little bit of innovation and diluting the overall effectiveness? So what you do, uh, and we've, got, um, we've now done this as, uh, several times, as I said, is you do this disruptive stuff at the edge. So at the opening session, you freak out the management, and then you leave them alone. Okay? And it's like a, a doctor giving a kidney. Well, if you do a kidney transplant, the doctor will give a patient an immune suppressant drug. Right? Uh, and so the kidney has new kidney has time to bed, hold, take hold. What we found is that opening workshop, like if you had all your teams going through this, it freaks them out enough that when a new idea arrives, they don't attack it the way they normally would. Right? So it kind of fakes them out for a little while. And then the idea is time to bed down, take hold, and if it's producing results, then everybody likes it. Uh, and also, if you're going to adjacent spaces and not, you can't, if you try and do disruptive innovation for the existing business, the immune system will attack it. And so that becomes very uncomfortable. If you say, go into an adjacent area and go disrupt over there, like Nestle with Nespresso, then the immune system doesn't attack because it's a complementary add-on business that they can, they can go after. They'll still try and attack it because they should stay, they'll say, we should do it. And our, our suggestion there is keep it stealth. Keep it, don't tell the business that you're doing it. Right? Definitely don't tell the legal and HR people you're doing it because they'll, do, they'll come after it, uh, et cetera. And I'll give you a quick story. It's really important not to demonize the core organization. When I first joined Yahoo, I, I extracted kind of five major promises from Jerry Yang and senior management to come on board. Number one was I wanted to be off-site and far away from Sunnyvale. Number two, I wanted to be able to go off-brand so I could really take some risks and try new things, et cetera, and not threaten the main Yahoo yellow and purple thing. Number three, um, I wanted to be free of legal and HR rules. Um, number four, I wanted to be free of the Yahoo technology stack. If we wanted to build in Ruby on Rails, we should be able to do that. And number five was if somebody had a great idea, I wanted to give them equity in that idea. Otherwise, they could just do a startup, especially in Silicon Valley. And so how do you deal with that? So after a bunch of discussion, um, they agreed to this. I actually got them to prick their thumbs in blood. And I wanted like total sign off all the way to the highest level to, to have this freedom to operate. Um, it was day two. I was sitting in my empty offices, with, uh, which were off-site, with my team. And a furniture truck rolls up. And, the, guy, and I, I, the doorbell rings, and the guy says, I'm here to deliver your furniture. 
And we said, wait a minute, we didn't, we didn't order any furniture, who are you? And he said, I'm from facilities and my job is to furnish any office within 48 hours of it opening. So I'm here. And we open up the back of the truck and it's full of like cubicles and yellow and purple couches. It's like Dilbert hell. Right? And I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 go, go, ba go back. We don't want this. You know, we're, we want bean, bean, uh, uh, bean bags and ping pong tables. This is anathema for what we're trying to do. And he says, no, I'm coming in. My bonus depends on me delivering the furniture. So I spend the afternoon calling his boss, his boss's boss, his boss's boss's boss, my boss, et cetera, et cetera. And after the whole afternoon, I'm, ready to, I'm able to get rid of the guy. And he's muttering away going, I want to sign off that this doesn't affect my bonus because I was here, et cetera, et cetera. So I finally get rid of the guy. Two weeks later, same furniture truck rolls up, same guy. And I said, what happened? He goes, my manager changed, noticed you didn't have the furniture and I've ordered to deliver it. I was like, shit. <laughs> and he, now it's important, he's not being a bad guy. He's just trying to do what the business as a kind of in its effort for efficiency, et cetera, is trying to get done. Meanwhile, it's completely an, an, an orthogonal to what I'm trying to accomplish over on the edge, right? And so the extent, now that's one rule. You, to add all the others of HR, legal, finance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it's anathema to this. And it'll kill, either you dilute the hell out of your offering, or it takes so long to get to market, you never get done. And I'll use Google Plus as an example here. Uh, Google spent two and a half years building Google Plus. Uh, kind of getting the whole company on board, figuring out, et cetera. And if you look at Google+, Plus, it's a brilliant product. The information architecture is sublime. The, the, the navigation is incredible. The simplicity they've managed to extract. But in that two and a half years, Facebook's gone. So you, the opportunity cost of, of kind of need, trying to do it internally. So our suggestion is go do the stuff externally into adjacent areas. Leave the existing business as a cash cow continuing to go the way it is, and then let it deprecate slowly over time. Uh, let these new things become the new gravity center if they're successful. Okay, so that's our suggestion for going forward. Okay, I've got two or three more questions we can deal with. We'll go there, and then we'll go there. And then I'll wrap it up. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm facing a pattern that kind of relates to what you said about Walmart there. So uh, after you did build the EXO at the edge, and <clears throat> that became a success, then suddenly that kind of becomes important. Yeah. So many of the stakeholders in the company that were not related to that, they want to own it some way. Yes. So now the, the CIO looks at it and says, well, I need to be responsible to handle this. Yes. That was done with entirely new technology that I don't have the staff on how to work on this. So what have you seen as ways to handle this sort of next step? Yeah, next step, really critical because there's a huge failure mode when you brick it back in. A okay, couple of comments about that. One, if it's truly disruptive, it will not fit neatly anywhere inside your organization. It's going to cut across a bunch of existing business lines, and you're going to get into a huge political fight as to who owns it internally. Secondly, you bring it back in, and you're going to have the existing leadership, which is legacy thinking, overseeing this new thing, and they're going to kill it, which is what Walmart saw. Okay? The, you have to spin it off. Do not spin it back in. Spin it off, create a separate entity around it, et cetera, and keep, keep doing that. You see the, what Google, Google's breakup into Alphabet is a perfect example of this. You know, we've got a, whole, a lot of different disparate lines of business. The uh, traditional thinking is let's bring it together and get efficiencies of scale, et cetera. Totally doesn't work. Uh, because the time you spend doing that, you're not focused on the customer and you lose out in this world. Break it up into independent unions. Uh, Virgin Group is, is particularly good at this. Uh, every time a company becomes big enough, Richard spins off a different entity, right? And you look at Virgin Atlantic and Virgin America, different, same airline essentially, but even after eight years, they're only now stitching the loyalty plan together because you want them operating separately so they can serve their markets at that individual level. So our strong advice is don't try and spin it back in at all. It just causes too much tension. Now the business will not like it at all, right? But that's what leadership is about today. You have to be strong enough as a leader to do this. And the, the kind of, this is a critical point around the short-termism that we're seeing today. Uh, Wall Street quarterly earnings are driving so much short-term thinking, nobody's architecting these organizations for the long-term in this environment. So I'll give you the kind of the indictment that I've seen. You know, over this last five years, I've talked to maybe 700 C-suite execs in Fortune 1000 companies, and they break down into basically three buckets. About 40% of them have no idea that this disruption is coming, right? So they've got a big problem. The second 40% knows it's coming, but they go, not in my industry, it won't affect me. It'll affect those guys over there, but it won't affect me. Right? And there's a cognitive dissonance because I can't possibly be affected in my construction industry over here. Then you know, that leaves 20% of in, uh, executives that really get that this is happening and that it will affect their industry. 
I found that 15 out of the 20 do nothing because they've got 18 months left in their pay period or in their contract. They have no incentive to make short-term structural changes and affect the short share price in the short term. So they literally leave it, and then they leave the company. And so these companies, we think, are going to fall off a cliff over time as they go forward. OK? Last question, and then we'll move on. And I'm just going to end it there. I hope it's a good one. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No pressure. Go ahead. Um, so you talked a little bit about that immune response and how to build um, exponential organizations, but I'm wondering how we translate that to building exponential societies, especially with highly regulated areas like finance um, and healthcare that are really beholden to regulators who may or may not even understand this emerging technology, looking at like cybersecurity is a perfect example of this. So how do we meet in the middle? How do we work at the edge with regulators for whom this change is really, you know, initiating that immune response. Okay, so I've got 30 seconds to answer. How do you engineer an exponential society? Okay, uh, I'm going to punt that question because when after we finish this next session, I'm going to come and do the closing uh, uh, kind of wrap up and I'll address it there because I've been thinking about that and I think that's a key point. So with that, uh, thank you very much for having me. We're going to turn it over to Bob for this next session. Thank you.